All right. Well, hello and welcome again, everyone. It's uh, Thad and Sharon here with our leader cast. And um, today, Thad's on the hot seat. So I'll let him say hi for a minute and then I'll, I'll get back to what we're talking about today. I, I do want to let everyone know that watches this and you, Sharon, that this morning I was like, I should look more presentable today. <laughs> yeah. I didn't put a hat on. I did my hair. I wore a black shirt. That's what I always wear. I didn't wear like Alabama today. <laughs> so I was thinking about it. I was like, I need to get ready for this. So yeah, it'll be fun. And well, it's a topic that we talk about that I'm I'm well, excited about. So yeah. Well, we always appreciate people cleaning up, right? So <laughs> <laughs> well, as you guys know, who's watching, we don't usually discuss in detail what we're talking about. We come up with a topic either the night before or the day off. So um that's on the hot seat. We're going to talk about who is my neighbor. It's a story taken from the good, um, from the book of Luke, chapter 10, on the Good Samaritan. And with the holidays right on top of us, you know, we have Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. It's it's a good time to think about what does it mean to be a good neighbor. And so um, I'm going to have you jump this off that. You know the story. I don't know if you want to recap real quick, but there's so many things in that story as I was preparing in my mind this morning um, about who is my neighbor. I think about my own neighborhood, you know, and my own concept of neighbor and how that has changed and shifted. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to have you give us a recap of that. Sure. Um, so I found it. It's in Luke 10. Mm -hmm. um, if people want to refresh. And I think in thinking about this, so I, we did, we talked about this yesterday it, for transparency. You were like, what topic should we do? And I texted you a bunch and you said, and then I was like, it's also, you mentioned Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's also Halloween coming up, which <laughs> some people maybe don't observe that. They do a fall festival, which there's a great TikTok right now of like the different denominations. And we don't do, we don't do Halloween. We dress up and kids come to the church and get candy, but it's not Halloween. It's fall festival <laughs> and so <laughs> whatever people do I'm the least prejudiced when it comes to like doing things or not doing things like you need to work it out with you and God but mm -hmm. there is this invitation like there's a lot of people in the next three months that are going to be around more family in town more people on the street a uh, holiday time where people kind of have you know if you have kids in the neighborhood and this is a great probably one of the best parables that I know of that Jesus gave and everybody knows it um the story is an expert in the law mm -hmm. which we're talking in Ezra and Nehemiah that Ezra was like the first expert in the law right which is cool I'd never known that before he tests Jesus in verse 25 terrifying thing to do what must I do to inherit mm -hmm. eternal life Jesus sums up all of the law and two commands love God and love your neighbor Mm -hmm. I've heard it said, love God with all of yourself and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and then it says that the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself, which he tests Jesus, not a good idea. And then he wants to justify himself, also not a good idea. That's verse 29. Jesus tells him a story about a guy that gets mugged. Um, and all of this is very, um, for the teacher in the law, it was a specific place. Mm -hmm. He says in verse 30, he was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So it's this idea that like he knew that road, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't like this hypothetical situation. The road was also dangerous physically. It was dangerous with people mugging. Think about a part of Charlotte or whatever part that you're from. I think about when my brother and I walked away from the Alabama game in Atlanta with our three boys and we walked because the Uber was like 120 bucks. And I'm like, I'll never do that again because it was dangerous. Yeah, that, that's the road. He says, here's a dangerous road. Three people after the guy gets mugged, pass by and Jesus does something brilliant. And you said you wouldn't let me preach. And I'm I'm getting I'm getting there. Um, he I'm does watching something. you. <laughs> OK, he does something brilliant. And he says uh, the first person that comes by. And, and what does he say? He says a priest mm -hmm. happened to be going down the same road. So. Um, this would have been, uh, the, probably the highest, mm -hmm. um, I think I can't get the order right, but basically it's like a priest would have been like, Hey, if anybody's going to be a good neighbor, it's going to be a priest, right? The priest went down the other side of the road, but the teacher in the law would have been like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Because 
if a priest got close to a dead body, it says in one law, like if your shadow passes over a dead body, you're impure. Mm -hmm. And the priest is on his way to Jerusalem. The man was on his way from Jerusalem. So he's on his way to do sacrifices. If he's impure, he's got to go like make himself pure again. He can't even do what he's on his way to Jerusalem to do. So the teacher's like, well, that makes sense. And then Jesus says, and then a Levite, which would have been maybe like a step down, um, but still really important. And he says he goes by and he too goes on the other side. If Levites, if priests touched a dead body, they were impure. There's also a risk like I'm on my way to do something important. What if I get mugged? What if this is a trap? I, I have a really important religious thing to do. Uh, think of a pastor on his way to church on a Sunday morning. I've got to preach. I can't stop for this homeless person. You know, the person thumbing their way, like they might be trying to hurt me. So I'm just going to go. Mm -hmm. And then the third person is where it's brilliant, is what I think is so fascinating, is you would think a priest and then a Levite, and maybe you would think like a normal Jewish man, mm -hmm. right? The priest is the highest and the Levite, then like a 17-year-old a Jewish man. But Jesus goes like the furthest away from like piety as he could, and he says a Samaritan. And if you don't know anything about, if the listener doesn't know anything about, it, I assume you do, Jews and Samaritans as they hated each other. It had been hundreds, maybe thousands of years to this point that they despised each other. You can see Jesus even argues with the Samaritan woman at the well a little bit. She accuses him, he accuses her. They kind of go back and forth. Um, there was bad blood between them. Um, and so he jumps to this, like, basically for us, who's the most offensive person who's the most offensive person you could think of and that's the person that then says he went to him he bandaged his wounds verse 34 poured oil and wine put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him basically what the guy does is he takes care of this mugged and unconscious person in the same way he would want someone else to take care of him if you've ever been sick, right? <laughs> I haven't been sick in a while, but if you've ever been sick and you're like, I need cold medicine and you go to the store and all they have is like the name brand, super expensive stuff. You're like, I don't care how much it costs. I need it right now or I'm going to die. You know, it's not true. You're not going to die. He basically spares no expense. Mm -hmm. And then he asks the guy, the teacher, the expert, he says, so which one was a neighbor? Right. And he hates this Samaritan example so much. He can't even say his name. What does he say in verse 37? The one who had mercy. He doesn't yeah. say the Samaritan. He can't, it's like, what's the, what's the person that you can't even utter their name? Right. Can't even utter who they are. That guy, you know? And I've heard, this might be close to home for people watching, but um, like when uh, couples get divorced and they're so uh, embittered, maybe for good reason against their ex, that they refer to them as my, my son's mom. Mm -hmm. right they won't say their name they won't say my ex-wife they don't even want the association they say that like well his mom it's it's like <laughs> kind of in a joke me and Kristen do it when our kids misbehave that's your son you know <laughs> like yeah. in a funnier way but this is serious and then Jesus says oh wait 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 because I'm not gonna have you preach the, 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 we're gonna, the we're gonna stop one, right there okay go and, do, go and do likewise all right okay that's you do later. okay Done. perfect <laughs> um backstory I want to go back through it a little bit, a little bit different take on it. Um, because yeah. you 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 explain really well, you know, the the office of the priest, the office of the Levite, right? And of mm. course, the history of the Samaritans. And I just want people to think about this in context of today, right? So when I think about, like you said, the enmity between Jews and Samar and Samaritans, and look at it from this perspective, right? So a Jewish man, we're gonna assume that the guy who got robbed was a Jewish man. A Jewish man got robbed. So you would assume that the pastor, which, okay, priest then pastor now, That's good. would have mercy, right? Yeah. But he didn't. I don't care what he was doing, he didn't have mercy. You would, you would assume that the elder or the deacon or whatever in your denomination would have mercy. Um, and, and he didn't, but then the unbeliever did, right? Mm -hmm. The unbeliever mm -hmm. did. And so I want I want us to look at it and reframe it that like that because sometimes we, when we read scripture and we think it's for that time, we don't realize that we're doing the same, 
we're practicing the same types of behavior in our time. So the pastor passes by, and he has an excuse, I have to get to church. And the, uh, the elder passes by or the deacon, and he has an excuse, well, you know, I, I got to get, I got to do my job. And then it's, and then the sinner mm -hmm. passes by, but does the right thing. And isn't that one of the, one of the challenges we have as Christians, where the world typically a lot of times behaves like we should be behaving, mm -hmm. but we do not. Uh, can I say one thing? Yeah, no, this, this is a question for you. Yeah. There, uh, there's a book called The Art of Neighboring. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a, a report from a city official and they say, I wrote it down because it was so good. Uh, they said they see no, no difference between how Christians mm -hmm. and non-Christians neighbor in the community. Like city officials couldn't tell. And, oh, and maybe wow. that's not true of you or, or of, of people watching this. Maybe you go, no, I know there's a difference. I know city officials, but they go across the board, how Christians versus non-Christians act as neighbors. They can't tell. Oh, they can't wow. tell which one's better, which one's worse. And that's a great way to compare it is the lead pastor, senior pastor, and then elder, deacon, leader, and then non-believer. And that's very accurate. They would have thought Samaritans didn't know who God was. And mm -hmm. they, I don't think they did because um, they missed Jesus. But yeah, it's, uh, it's compelling, right? Because it's not yes. just neighboring. It's with everything. Exactly. When you look at Christian morality or morality in general, um, honesty, integrity, greed, all the stuff. How are we marked differently? You know? it's, it's, sad. it's a sad commentary that you just said about that what the city officials are saying that you couldn't tell. And, and it, it goes to the heart of this, you know, like what makes a good neighbor, right? When, what, how could we be better neighbors as Christians? We're supposed to be um, salt and light, right? But then the world can't tell the difference. As a matter of fact, just even based on this parable that Jesus spoke about and what, I, what some of us have experienced, the world acts better. Mm -hmm. You have some really fun people in this world who would put, take the shirt off their back for you, but they don't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you, because of our behavior, we don't have the opportunity to share Christ. Yeah. Um, to that dying person. And that person is kind of like showing us up as neighbors. And so how can we as Christians though, you know, really re change that perception? What are some of yeah. the things that I would and, add, and be and be authentic about it? I would say, what are some? Why is it? Why is it that Christians, if we just talk about neighborliness, mm -hmm. why is it that we're not distinct? And and maybe I I don't know you and Wayne's role in your neighborhood. I know me and Kristen's, um, but I, I wonder what some of those reasons, I don't know if you even have any off the top of your head, what would be some of the leading reasons that people would be? Um, I can not, think of some. Yeah, go for it. What do you think? You know, I think at the heart of it is love. And it sounds very simplistic, but it's not. You know, Jesus said that, you know, people would know us by our love, right? They would know, you know, we are his, by, you know, by our love, right? He said something in that general, general thing. And I think Love is a really difficult emotion for people. Yeah. We can love our pets. We can love our kids. We can love our husband and spouse, whatever. And maybe even some extended family members, but that's kind of like the limit. I, I feel like almost love, and you know, I love the word intentional, right? But I, I really love the word intentional because I've had to practice a lot of stuff with intention. L loving people who are not in your inner circle, I had to ask God to give me that heart. Yeah. Loving people who are not as lovely, I've I've had to ask God to give me that heart as well. So you have to you have to be intentional about this. And I think that's what we don't have while we're not good neighbors. And and we're not talking about this neighbor as you know, as as the, the Bible was pointing out too. Neighbor is not just the person to your right and to your left or in your neighborhood. Right. Neighbors go beyond that now, especially in this digital world. Sure. Neighbor is anyone who you can help, who you have impact or access to, yeah. who have access to you. But if I, I want to push back on that because I think sometimes we justify not being a neighbor to our literal neighbors. Yes. Because we're trying to be neighbors to 8 billion people. Yeah. And we're True. like, well, we, we give money. We pray for the world. 
but then there's like literal flesh and blood next to you that you just ignore or don't know anything about. And this is this is a question that I because I, I don't know why people I think because you said how do we your question was how do we do it differently right because mm-hmm. um, I think to start you have to figure out like what is the reason so Jesus is saying the sum of all of the law <laughs> mm-hmm. is a challenge in ancient world was like to how can we simplify the law so you have six hundred and thirteen laws you have ten commandments you have do justice, love mercy, act humbly, right? Um, whatever. And he says, love God, love your neighbor. So right. those are the two most important things. The word love is mentioned twice till you notice that. Yeah. If, it, if it says these are the two most important things, yeah. we should maybe prioritize them. Right. It goes back to love, Thad. It goes back to love. Love is a very hard emotion. Yeah. We but, can love our family, but it's hard to, for people to love others. Yeah. But that's, so, why, that's, why bad, that's why Christians have a bad rap. Yeah, because I, I look at it as a parent. Is, a, is the time that I'm investing in my family mm-hmm. it's very important. But if it's preventing me from having time to physically, tangibly, practically love my neighbors. Like, what are the pro- how am I putting my priorities in place? And I think that's, for me, I look at one, I've always used this illustration, is that oftentimes um, we're so preoccupied with what we have to do. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the illustration, uh, and no offense if you do this, Sharon, or anyone else watching, that when you leave for work in the morning, if people actually aren't working from home, they get in their car in their garage, they open the garage, and they back out, and they close the garage door, and they drive to work, and they come home nine hours later, they pull in the garage and they shut the door and then they walk in through their garage door. They never say anything to the people in their neighborhood. Maybe they wave. Maybe they give them a little, hey, what's up? But we're in a hurry. Mm-hmm. And Jesus had this, um, I, I'm still failing at it every time I see him do it again, is he was so interruptible. Mm-hmm. It's like a really simple thing if people are like, what could I do differently if I'm actually going to be a neighbor? One, you have to get to know them. And what's one way you can do it is like park in your driveway (laughs) or like park your car and then walk through your driveway and like go get your mail. And if you see anybody like say hi, Mm -hmm. you know, something along those lines, because I think there's this piece that we can be such in a hurry. Jesus had way more important things to do than us. And he would allow himself to be interrupted by the lowest of people. They weren't his physical neighbors, but they were neighborly because they were around him. And he met with them and he saw them and he heard their story and he ministered to them. And I think as soon as I say that, I'm like, how am I going to have time to do that? (laughs) So it's like that hurry time thing is, I think, a big one for us. We have so many things. When I get home today, I already have an agenda of what I need to do because my kids have programs and my parents are here and we have to do dinner and like all these things where I justifiably could pass by on the other side of the road on my way home. I got we can you. we can justify a lot of things that you meant you you also asked the question like how do I prioritize between my family you, you know and and the neighbor time and and of course we know that family really come first but we can involve our family for example practical yeah. tips right we have a neighbor we have a barbecue or we have them over for dinner we again it takes intention it's like okay I am going to you can make a goal right I know we're going to talk about goal setting at the end of the year but you can make a goal like I am going to be intentional about inviting these four people over the next two months. Yeah. It, it, it just is. It's a decision. Yeah. And let's go back to this story. They don't have to look like me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. They don't have to um, believe like me necessarily. They don't have to have the same political views like me. They mm-hmm. don't have to have the same um, religious views as me. I'm just going to be a neighbor. Yeah, yeah. And there's a gentleman in my neighborhood. I will tell you, my husband and I and his, him and his wife, we are as different as night and day. <laughs> I have this light yeah. in my face. Um, he's old, much older than us. Um, different everything. Just, you know, he's very vocal about his politics. He's very, he's just... No, I don't think he's liked by his own neighbors, direct neighbors, but boy, me and my husband, we love him and his wife. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing, right? And um, he just loves us too, him and his wife. 
And yeah. we go and we, we go over to their house, you know, for the holidays. They, I mean, it's just odd. I'm telling you, when I tell it's odd, it's odd. It's a God thing. But I look at it and I say to myself, no, if I had just looked at this man and not gotten to know him, there's no way I would go into his house. Sure. Because I've been thinking a lot of thoughts about his activity is very vocal. It's a yard sign everywhere. It's very, very vocal. It is just, you know, maybe people might find him obnoxious. But when you get to meet him and his wife, the, 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 the things that we've learned from them about life, about business, about relationships, oh my God, it's priceless. Yeah. About Christmas, about the holidays, very yeah. priceless. And so I think about how we make suppositions when people don't look like us sure. or believe like us, share the same political view like us or the religious views, and it's not being neighborly. And then we say we were the banner of Christ, we're Christians, but yet still. Yeah. yeah. And this is, I think, what the heart of what Christ was getting to when he says, go and do likewise, right? Mm -hmm. You know, go and do it likewise. Don't necessarily, you know, be that unbeliever believer. Be yeah. be that unbeliever neighbor. And I, um, it's, against a decision that you make. Yeah, and I I think that's the. I've wrestled with this since we started talking about it and thought about this a lot of like the why. Because mm -hmm. we could jump to you know a joke we've said before when it comes to being neighborly is don't marry K your neighbors. No offense if people. <laughs> Yes, true. <laughs> like, don't be friends with them just so you have an opportunity to share the gospel. You, right. you want to do that, yeah, obviously, but Jesus <laughs> commands it. Yeah. He says, summarize the law, and he says, love God and love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. You can't love them unless you don't, unless you know them. And so, like, why should we try and get to know our neighbors? One, out of obedience, because mm -hmm. he commands you to. Um, and even what you're saying, Sharon, I feel like Every time we obey what Jesus is calling us to do, even when it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, we learn more about him. Mm -hmm. So when we forgive people when they don't deserve it, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, you forgive me and I don't deserve it. When we're generous right. with our money, well, you were generous with your eternal wealth and giving it to me. You know, when we love other people that we think are annoying, I'm like, how annoying am I to God? sometimes you know but he chooses to love us mm -hmm. and the second thing is there is an opportunity for witness mm -hmm. he mentioned it they'll know us by how we love one another and they'll see the father because we love one another and we treat and not just within christian circles that we treat people well and kristen and i have a lot of work to go in this but one of the things that we've been encouraged on well two things mm -hmm. um and this came up in the same book uh, art of neighboring is we moved uh we were intentional about spending time on our front yard. Our backyard's nice. We have this, you know, screened in patio area. We love it. Got a little heater there now for the summer or for the winter, you know. Um, but you don't meet people in your backyard. You meet the two maybe next to you. And so sometimes we've literally like made dinner and we bring it out and put it on our driveway, like on the concrete or uh, we're right across from this little T section of our road. And we put the dinner on the sidewalk across from our house and we have plates for the kids to eat. And they're like on their bikes and rollerblades and we're just hanging out and people are walking by and we just go, hey, how's it going? And they're like, what are you doing? We're like, we're having dinner. And they, some people stop and say, hey, some people don't. We don't do it every night or anything, but like I set up a chair out there and I'll just watch the kids while I like read a book or something and just being present. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is that uh, there's other believers in our neighborhood that we've gotten to know. And they, there's one couple in particular that every time they see us, the husband is so nice. And he just goes, I am just so thankful that you guys are in this neighborhood. Yeah. You've made this neighborhood so much better. And I'm, I'm like, I'm sure you say this to everybody, <laughs> like, how do you know? I'm like, I'm kind of selfish sometimes. My grass gets a little long, yada, yada. But there is this, like, other people start to see it mm -hmm. and they go, why do you neighbor like that? Why do you go out of your, it'd be way easier not to invite people into your home. Mm -hmm. And I think that's those little things that we can start to do of just creating conversation with people. Now we look at our neighborhood and I'm like, I never want to leave. Yeah, we know the people on the left side, both of the houses on our left side, we know them, our kids play with them. Uh, 
the three houses on this side, we all know them. Some of them are grandparents. We know them really well, both the people across the way. And then like another house down, like we have good friends all over that our kids love to play with. We trust and they're all different than us. Some of them are grandparents. Some of them, uh, one couple is just dating. They're not even married. They, one of the people have kids and, and like, we just know them and spend time with them, you know, and it's not like, we have this calendar of like, oh, we need to spend time with this house because we haven't done it. We just make ourselves available, mm -hmm. which is what Jesus did. Exactly. I like the practical tip. Your, right. your idea that you and Kristen did, I, I think it's a great, great uh, tip because I, I remember meeting the neighbors in my neighborhood just from the front porch, just sit with your dogs and, you know, a dog walker myself. But you're right. In your backyard, you won't have that opportunity. So even if something as even if you're a shy person, yeah. a simple thing like just sitting on your porch and saying hi is the first step to warm up. Okay. You know, someone may say, "Hey, how is it going today?" Hey, it's going good. It's the first step. So I really, I think that's a really good practical tip. Do you know that in Isaiah 58, um, it mentions that that when you bring the stranger in your house, right, there's a particular blessing. Mm -hmm. that God um, reserves for you, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 I'll find the, the verse in a minute, but as a practice, what Wayne and I used to do when we lived in Florida, when we had a charity, every year we would invite someone that's a stranger, that's down under your luck really bad yeah. um, to, to come to our house for dinner. Mm -hmm that maybe they might be homeless, maybe they might be, well, you know, whatever the situation, um, just being on a struggle bus. And it always ends up blessing us and the other guests sure. that we yeah. have tremendously. Yeah. And all I'm saying is that it, we can just start. It's, we have an opportunity coming up with, with, you know, whether it's Halloween, whether it's Thanksgiving, whether it's Christmas, mm -hmm. to invite just a neighbor to be a little bit more neighborly. What would that look like for you front porch sitting, inviting someone into your home, a progressive dinner planned in your neighborhood. If you're a leader type person, you could do that. I mean, there's so many things that we can yeah. do without saying we're Christians. Right. And then we earn the right to be asked. But they they see difference. Yes. So I, we had a golf thing uh, two weeks ago with the a Methodist church as a fundraiser. And it's non-Christians go to that too. So they do a big fundraiser for the men's ministry. And at the end of it, we're sitting there and these guys are talking and just horrible language. Like I'm, I'm very far removed from the restaurant now. Like I don't hear profanity very much. <laughs> and, but I, I used to, right. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like foul mouths. Like what is going on? Are they part of this thing? And they're like, oh yeah, we have most of our people not from here. On Halloween night, we take our kids trick-or-treating. You think that we're offensive? I'm sorry. We're not doing it to worship the devil at all <laughs> go and our kids love it we get other neighbors with little kids i have a nine seven and five year old we go around our neighborhood's awesome for candy um it's also budget conscious because then we take all the candy we give our kids some of it and then we pass out the candy that we've collected so the people coming are getting the candy that they've just given us <laughs> what we do is we do that at like five and then we invite neighbors whoever wants to to sit on our driveway and we put a little semicircle with our fire pit in the middle and people can walk up and get candy from each house that's represented and we just hang out. Right. And awesome. Compared to what I experienced at the golf outing, people will see me and my wife and my kids and they see how we interact, the words we use and, and the discipline that I'm sure at some point will say no more candy because you're already losing your mind or whatever. And, and they, it's not like we don't have to walk around and carry a tract. We will be different by the way that we speak. Mm -hmm. And that's a testimony to, a lot. and, you know, I don't know the person Halloween, I feel like is such a good opportunity if it's not offensive to you. It, I heard it said one time, there's one day a year that all of your neighbors expect you to knock on their door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. Halloween. Right. And so we take it and we go, we're going to, we're going to take opportunity and get to just see people's faces and be like, oh, we live down here. It's good to see you again, you know, and it's just one of those moments where we get to spend some fun time with other neighbors and their kids. And I tell you what, Sharon, it's funny. Um, 
a handful of our neighbors come to our church too. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it wasn't our goal. It wasn't like, oh, let's get to know them because we need them to come. It was, let's get to know people. And then they ask what we do. And we're like, oh, I'm a pastor and we're part of this church. And we're like, if you don't have one, you should totally come. It's like super normal. And it's right. impossible. like, if you don't invite them to church, like, do you not want them to come? Right. And exactly. people, you know, those new neighbors just moved in. And we talked about church all the time. They didn't say anything. And we get done. Chris and I are like, I don't think they're churchy people because they didn't say one thing about it. <laughs> and we really dropped it a lot. And we go, okay, we'll just keep hanging out with them. And maybe they come, maybe they don't, but we're right. still commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we're trying to be obedient. And I think that's for me, what it comes down to. And it's more fun to have it a neighborhood is. where you know people and they know you watch out for you, you know? Yep. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's a good way as we as we're coming to the conclusion of this. I think we've given some practical tips, really. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, I would just I would just invite us all to think about how could we up our game a little bit this holiday, right? With yeah. with um with the neighbors. What's one thing that we could do? Is it sitting on your front lawn? You know, is it being brave enough to invite someone over to your house for some, you know, hors d'oeuvres? Is it organizing a progressive dinner? Yeah. So there's something that you can do and it's not just frivolous it's what the lord commanded right that we should love our neighbors as ourselves and mm -hmm. that it is by the love of others that people know that we are we are children of god so um any final words from you thad <laughs> when we did the last one on sabbath you go do you think people are sinning if they're not sabbathing and i said my answer is i think Yes, because it's a Ten Commandment, mm -hmm. one of the ten. Do I think people are sinning if they're not trick or treating? <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely okay. not. It is not one of the. It's not one of the ten on October thirty first. Go door to door. It is an opportunity, and I think this, in my justification of it, falls in line with Paul in Acts when he says to the different groups, he talks to them based on what they understood. And he says, to the Jews, I became a Jew. And to the Gentiles, I became a Gentile mm -hmm. so that I could reach some. Like his goal was to be as flexible as possible without contradicting the gospel that he believed. And I think that's the the encouragement. I love your piece, Sharon. Um, maybe you don't believe in Halloween. That's cool and fine. So who are you going to invite over in the next mm -hmm. month? Right. Like, who, don't don't use that as a reason. Be like, oh, they all trick or treat. I'm not going to open up my home. Like you have a big, you have a home. You know how to make, you can order pizza. You don't have to do anything fancy. People love it, you know? And so, That's yeah. true. And if you're right. And if you're watching this and it's, you know, Halloween has already passed, right? If you're watching this oh, and yeah. it's past Halloween, um, you have Thanksgiving and right. do something brave. Invite someone that's different from you. Maybe less fortunate, maybe a different, you know, something different, different ethnicity, different religion, different right. politics. Yeah. You'd be amazed how much you have in common. Yeah. And it's an opportunity. Um, to have the light of Christ shine through you. Yeah. So until the next time, it's bye from Sharon and Dad. <laughs> Take care. All right. Bye.